Hi, I'm Christina. Welcome to The Void. We're here with Ben Weinman of Dillinger Escape Plan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. We've it's done a few of these interviews. Over a nine-year period. Over a nine-year period, yeah. So we've tracked some things. Yeah, we should put an excellent and see how I've aged. It's like when you look, when people put pictures of Obama <laughs> before he was president and at the end of the time and he looks like all busted up. So this is your finale voyage. How did you sort of come to this decision? Was it an easy decision or, cause I know you guys yeah. are quite thoughtful. Yeah, Yeah, honestly, uh, it's something that I brought up to the guys. Um, I think it surprised everybody and didn't at the same time. I think, um, you know, the past couple of years, it's been going in this direction without us even knowing it. And then uh, when I suggested it, well, I mean, it's a shock because it's just all we know for so long, but um, I think once everyone started really thinking about it, it started to really make sense. Like it would be a brave, really good way to um, take control over the whole legacy and everything and do it the right way. And that's how I felt. I was like, you know, there's no way to um, predict the, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. how it can end. And like, I don't think it, Dillinger's ever been about um, not having intention. You know? Yeah. Like, so. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everything had meaning. Yeah, well, that's a good. I think it's cool to to be the architect of your own destiny, and I don't. Yeah. I think it's like true to everything you've done as artists. Like you've never done things unconsciously. Yeah. Like I read something about the, like the last album where Greg wasn't feeling the vocals for two uh -huh. weeks, and then he did it. So yeah. I'm like, you haven't done anything accidentally, like ever. Yeah. So we've always tried to do things that just felt right. So this is one of them. Yeah. Well, it's a great album. You've, you obviously have been with now Billy and Liam and Greg for a while and yeah. stuff. How has Greg changed you as a songwriter? Oh, man. I don't know if he's changed me as a songwriter, but he's made my songs way better. But you know what I mean? If that makes sense. I mean, it's a weird process because, like, I, the music is typically finished completely uh, before he even is involved at all. So um, I tend to just, I, I, you know what, probably like the work we do in previous albums probably definitely influences moving forward when I write albums and stuff like that. But um, uh, I guess, and so yeah, I am probably am subconsciously thinking about like, you know, our uh, chemistry when we're writing for sure. But um, I've certainly seen him just grow and grow and grow throughout the this career and all the albums and everything. And well, he's become this really multifaceted singer. Like I was listening to the the latest album today and then measuring it back up against the first album he was on. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, there's been quite a journey from yeah. having all these kind of colors to paint with while once, you know, once upon a time being this, you know, just firebrand yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so on. But I, say, <laughs> I don't know what that, that wasn't a thing. No, I think but, it's, it's yeah. interesting because I think like, like our personalities come off in the, in our music. Uh, you know, songwriters together. Um, I think, like, my role has always been to be that stable constant that was like, you know, bringing the Dillinger sound and the, I just don't want to say the Dillinger ethic, but at least like the intention of why I started the band and maintain it. And I've also been a guy who's pretty much been the same guy for 20 years. Like, people who know me, they're like, that's Ben. He's Ben. He's the same Ben. And Greg's always been someone who's always changing and evolving and going through things. And, and you hear that. You know what I mean? So I think, um, That's a really interesting point. Yeah. yeah, so I think his whole journey is really represented on those albums vocally. Mm. And uh, I've been kind of that bass that keeps it, keeps it like within the, you know, the keeps it Dillinger, mm. I guess. I don't know. What is Dillinger? Yeah. Why did it start the band? Right. When you say why there's an ethic, why? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the, the purpose of this band was just to create something that didn't necessarily exist for us. And it wasn't um, to try to appeal to a certain market or to a certain type of music fan. Um, it wasn't to get a record deal or to tour the world or to be famous or to make all this money or anything like that. Um, it really was just to create that CD that we didn't feel existed for ourselves. We had given up really on making it. And uh, that's a very powerful thing. It's a freeing so thing, I think. What? It's a freeing thing to it's give up. It's a freeing up. thing. We gave up, uh, what, you know, uh, we had already, I was already, you know. A grown up. A grown up when I started this band, you know, technically, you know, I was already pretty much through college and stuff like that. So 
I had done a lot of, I've been in a lot of local bands and things like that before Dillinger started. So I could say that definitely, you know, when me and the guys that were in the band at the time made this band, we just really wanted to make something that really stimulated us like crazy. And at the time, there wasn't really a place for it. So we obviously weren't trying to appeal to someone. I mean, people hated it. How would you even honestly. contextualize? Well, how would you yeah. contextualize it? You can't. Like that's yeah. that's kind of it. I think that's what I kind of see with my friends who have been like lifelong fans of your band. Obviously, they're older than twenty, but um, that it sounded like nothing they'd ever heard before, and they're like, "Whoa! Like, what does this even? What does this even mean?" And it's. Yes. It's, I, what I think is really cool about it is just, is the balance of it. It's got this like real catharsis in it, but it, you've also got this really, um, you're really talented with balancing space in it. So like, you, it's like this onslaught of vocals, but then it pulls back a bit and then the music kind of comes out and there's almost like this, it's like this violence on top of this shifting sand mm. kind of sonic. Um, well, I think that's, yeah. that's really life, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of like, um, and, and this band's been very, uh, we've been very lucky to be able to be so adventurous and take so many, we've taken a lot of risks early on in this band, which gave us a huge freedom. What was the biggest risk you took, do you reckon? The biggest risk? Well, I think at a time when we started to get some popularity and there were some expectations of what we should sound like and who we should be, um, that was the biggest challenge, making sure that we, like, um, silenced that. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because it's real easy to, to start. Like, we were not cool kids. We were not part of a scene. We were not the ones with all the friends. We didn't have people coming to our shows. That were, we were not part of a clique. We weren't, you know, so um, it, it would have been real easy once all of, us, all of a sudden we started getting traction and, and um, there was a lot of hype around us in, this, like, the local scene where we came from. And we got signed to, like, a cool label. And, like, um, it would have been really easy for us to try and... Um, and, and kind of change gears. And when I say change gears, I don't mean like musically, I mean like with our intentions. So- um, Like try and get on a big tour and try and- Yeah, like I mean, like one of the things that I know uh, on our second album, Miss Machine, that like I did intentionally was include a song that I had written just for fun that I didn't think was for Dillinger. I didn't consider it a Dillinger song. It was a song called Unretrified. I love that song. And uh, it was something that I had just written from front to back, lyrically, melody, everything. And it was probably just going to be just something for fun or a side project or something like that. I didn't say, this is a Dillinger, you know? And I remember thinking to myself, why am I, why am I putting my, my music into a box? That's what I'm trying other people not to do. Why am I saying this is not Dillinger? I write Dillinger, I wrote this. It's fucking Dillinger. Dillinger. <laughs> it's Dillinger, you know? So um, including things like that intentionally on our sophomore release, which would have really defined what we were going to be moving forward, I think was an invent was a was a adventurous thing yeah, or whatever yeah. you know what I mean it was like a, a it was definitely a, making a statement that we weren't going to be able to be confined to a certain s specific like sound you know and that's a cool place and it's com you know you're kind of now you're kind of wrapping it in a twenty year package of yeah. life and experience and all that sort of stuff it's like um, I don't know it's it's interesting the yeah like the decision making process behind it all and also there's these weird kind of parallels with Trent Reznor except you've actually let them be other b other like limbs like yeah. they're actually because like Trent Reznor is Trent Reznor and yeah. then everyone plays his parts but uh -huh. you've kind of opened up your like organism and let them be legs and arms yeah. and like a voice and stuff cool, it's yeah. cool like you know yeah, do you feel no, like there's an the one thing you know I'll tell you this I, I was I it's funny you said that because um I was actually talking to Dimitri our original singer the other day and um, we were talking about how um, we our last shows in New York City like sold out like in two seconds, and we thought we were gonna like we could probably sell one of these rooms out. It's a big room, but and we sold out three and like very quickly. And um, he was like, "Dude, I can't believe that! Like we were playing in basements, and now there's like ten thousand tickets sold for your last." Show. And I'm like, "Yeah, it's crazy." And he's like, um, "You know, I feel so weird because like you know, I, I, the time was so important to me, but also there's so much that's happened without me. It's like." I always think about it all the time and everything. And I and I was thinking to myself, I was like, Dillinger is not a one person, or it's not it's not me, or it's not me and Greg, or it's not me, Greg and Liam, or but it's this thing that's all of it. Like it's this crazy mythology. You know what I mean? It it it's it's this crazy mythology. It's it's all these crazy stories that are pretty much all true. You know what I mean? Every crazy rumor is true. You know? Who thinks the wildest rumor that you can't believe actually happened? 
I mean, just there's this <laughs> stories. Of, all the stories are true. I mean, all the I, stories. I, just I, all I mean, them. even through things that happen, not even on stage. No, we've been attacked for, by gypsies. We've had a fight really? with gypsies in Germany. Tell us about the. Gypsies. We've had to. Oh, we were in Germany at some truck stop, and there was these like Afghanist, Afghani like gypsies, like refugees, living in the woods, and uh, our um, this guy Jeff Wood, who was our bass player at one point, and then he was just coming out as a tech with us. He was videotaping everything because he had never been to Europe, and he was like so fascinated. And I guess what he ended up videotaping was some kind of a exchange of prostitution or something. And they started yelling at him, trying to stay on the camera, and he didn't understand. He was trying to shake their hands. He's like, I'm from America, Jeff. And they're like, I'm like, Jeff, they're not your friends. He's like, da, 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 da. He's like, Jet me, Jeff. You know, I'm like, you know, like a caveman or something. And uh, basically, he, um, I was sleeping in the tour bus. We were parked for the night in this truck stop. And I hear a commotion, and I run, and I grab a bottle, and I run out, and I start running towards him because the guy's like on his neck he's running there's like two of them hanging off of him and I start running him towards him and I see like a hundred come out of the woods like toward and I'm just start going backwards and hey, yeah <laughs> and then uh they pretty much we all just I had, like had to jump in the like fight them off get into the bus wake the driver up like get the fuck out of here they were chasing us you used to be cursed a bit I remember when we what? first talked cursed you are worried you were cursed, like all the uh, fish yeah. died in a tank yeah, when you were yeah. making eyeworks. Like yeah, that's true too. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot. There was a fireworks, there was the fireworks curse. There was a, uh, you know. Yeah, but I mean, like, look, we've had a bass player that's been shot in the head, a bass player that's been paralyzed. We've been in even just a bus crash recently. We've been, a, yeah. you know what I mean? We've had. Um, how was that? How did that kind of change through your perspective? Because that's a confronting any kind of near-death experience. Yeah. I was talking to John from Baroness uh -huh. oh, in this exact in this stories. exact place thing, and he's like, yeah. "I had to deal with the fact that I might ne never yeah. be able to do all the things that mattered to me yeah. more than anything ever again." Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, he. Uh, I've talked to him about it a lot, um, and yeah, it was like, here we are on our final tour, and it's like, cool, <laughs> we made it twenty years <laughs> without getting in a crash, like. You know, every band I know who's toured hard and been through horrible winters and bands, all, all, I just, so all of them have gotten into some kind of crash or whatever. We've made it 20 years and we're about to break up and we get railed by a truck and it's like, great, yeah. you know? <laughs> Check that off. Yep. Can, can we be done now, <laughs> you know? Is well, someone telling us something, like, stop already? You know? It would have been scary. It was horrifying. Yeah. It was horrifying. My right. pregnant wife was with me. Holy shit. Like, in the, Whoa. you know, like, I, I was with her in the back of the bus, like not in a bunk, but like laying in the back of the bus and where the truck oh, hit mm -hmm. directly. And like, uh, it was like crazy surreal because I somehow, I don't know how, I was asleep. So like, I don't know how I did it, but I jumped up and like threw her up in the air to her oh. feet. And the bus came through Holy like shit, the dude. wall, like where her head was. Like Fuck. eight months pregnant. Whoa, yeah. that makes my blood run cold. That wasn't even there. I mean, we were against, like, like, yeah. Dude. It was crazy. Well, you got shit to do. Your terrible. family has things to do. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. it, I, you know, you think about stuff like that, you're like, holy moly, man. Well, how is having, how is having a child made you reflect on your firstborn, Dillinger? <laughs> yeah, you know what, you know, it's interesting. I think it's, it's similar, you know, similar. Yeah, I've had to clean shit multiple times in both scenarios. <laughs> um, <laughs> certainly. You made a people. Yeah. That's cool, man. Um, I did. I One day I was holding her, and I tried to get out of the bed, and the dogs were jumping on me or whatever, and my feet got wrapped up in a thing, and I fell off the bed holding her. I did some kind of Dillinger twist, jump, spin, and, like, fell. I broke my foot a little. I think I just fractured my foot and caught her, and I was like... All right, I've done that before, you know, <laughs> but it's a guitar and I'm trying to keep playing notes and not break my thing in half, you know. You saved your child. I s yeah. <laughs> it was it's that kind of me. a cool thing. Yeah. You've got those chapters, you know, those yeah. chapters nailed like totally. Dillinger for the first 20 years, now daughter for the next 20 years. That's right. That's yeah. right. I hope she's, I'm trying to make her a, a lesbian. Really? That's my way. You know too much about men? Yeah, I don't want no, I don't, <laughs> I don't want no penises coming around. <laughs> No penises. <laughs> Men are deeply flawed. I mean, what are you going to do? They've got their issues. They're very insecure with all the external genitalia. It's just, it's a word. Fine. 
Nice, well-dressed lesbian. Well, that's good. <laughs> Very happy with that. How do you even turn your baby into a lesbian? You just kind of scare her with pictures of dicks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> ah! Ah! And, and she's like a baby, so she doesn't even know what it is, but it's like <laughs> clockwork orange, you know? It's going to come back to her yeah. 15 years, yeah. like, into the future. One day, she's just going to be, like, totally feminist and... And, uh, you can do that without, you know, yeah. you don't have to be a lesbian. She can just be a feminist. Your wife's a surgeon, isn't she? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, she's cool. She saves people's lives. That's she comes home with blood on her and stuff. Like, Badass, man. Change. It's disgusting. <laughs> she's like, eh. <laughs> That's cool, though. It's good to find a person yeah. and make people and all that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah. It's important. It's a good life step. Yeah. So, Billy. How has Billy changed the way you see rhythm? <laughs> How does Billy change this way? Well, it's made me realize that white boys do have rhythm. <laughs> and they can jump. And they can jump. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, Billy's just just changed my attitude in general. You know, he's yeah. been, like, super inspiring. Um, he loves drums. He's so humble. He's um, He learns from everybody. He nev even people that he's clearly way better than, he doesn't think that way. You know, he's always, wow, this guy does this thing really cool. It's so awesome. He's, and um, he's just so humble and he's so, so into just get, being better and getting better. And, and, um, but he never sacrifices like living life and things like that. So, like, you know, I've worked with drummers and musicians who literally just sit there and practice all the time. Or, yeah. I've you know what I mean? And, and I, <laughs> I think that certainly hasn't, I, I think that's not the way to make music, you know, so. And it's not healthy. It's, and it's hard to, like, have that balance when you are so emotionally invested in what you do. And I think any of us as creative people, like, it's hard to kind of have life balance when you get that emotional kick from what you do. And that's a cool thing. I yeah. work all the time. And it's why well, I used to joke on Soundwave that um, all the bands get to work for 40 minutes and yeah. I sleep for 40 minutes. Yeah, so exactly. that's, um, yeah. you understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What is um, what is like the th your proudest moment with this band? I'm, I'm proud of, 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 I don't regret really anything looking back. I've certainly, uh, you know, uh, there's certainly ways I would handle things differently, but... Um, but I'm really proud of how we're, I'm really proud of how we've conducted ourselves throughout the years and how we're ending this, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that we're not doing this um, for the wrong reasons. We're not fighting and want to kill each other and we just can't be in a r room together so we're breaking up. We're not breaking up because there's like only three people watching us and it's just depressing and we just need to break up so we can reunite. You know, yeah, and, and yeah, and twenty years. Yeah, like let's I break call up. It the retirement plan tour. Like, right. Yeah. Let's reunite. Let Let's break up for the amount of time we would take in between albums anyway, and then, da -da. you know. Da -da. So you don't come. You're not coming back. I I don't have any intentions of that. You know, I can't say that we'll never get in a room together and make songs, or we'll never play a show ever. But it's not something I. It's hard to see that right now ever happening, and uh, yeah, people are. So when's the reunion? They're already asking that. You know. I'm like, I'm old, man. <laughs> you haven't spent all your money on cocaine. Dead. Yeah. I feel like all those bands that get back together, they spend all their money on drugs, yeah. and they went, oh well, shit. Kind of look. Most of those bands look pretty good. I don't know. I think I, I, I think I need to do more drugs <laughs> because they're all like preserved. Like Scott Weiland actually looked pretty young when he died. He really did. You know what I mean? Yeah, I and mean, you've never done drugs, have you? It's like pickled or something. Yeah. I don't know. No. You never did drugs, I did you? Just, I need to start doing. Maybe you start. should start doing drugs. Yeah. Maybe do I'll some mushrooms. How long I can go. And then when I start to, d then I'll start, you know. Maybe do some mushrooms. Self-medicating or something. Yeah. No, but do some mushrooms. You got any? Go on a I pro could probably get them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where. Yeah. Someone I know has got to have mushrooms. Yeah, I'm just going to ruin your show go tonight. Someone just go lick a toad or something. <laughs> yeah, Ben's just, sorry, Ben yeah. can't play guitar right now. He's oh, he's that? having his sort of psychedelic experience over there. Uh. <laughs> yeah, all of Sydney will hate exactly. me forever. Like, they'll yeah. be like, yeah, you stole Ben from I'll us, you monster. Writing, like music that's like a thousand reverb pedals and it's true oh, well at least it's not, i haven't ruined dillinger because you've already finished exactly. that um so who have been like the the musical people that you've stayed in touch with over the years i know you said you've had a long relationship with like mike Patton since yeah. you know quitting your job to go on tour with mr yeah. bungle like that's a that's yeah, a big I mean, moment i talked to him yesterday and um he's still uh, we're still close and um and it's cool to see him and Greg be friends too, you know, because uh, he was so important. He's really what brought 
Greg into the mix because Greg first saw Dillinger when we were on that tour with Mr. Bungle because he was a massive wow. like Patton fan, you know, and he wasn't necessarily like going to the kind of shows that we were playing, like all these weird punk basements and he stuff. He was a metal guy. Yeah, yeah he was kind of like a metal guy. And so him coming to see Bungle and then see Dillinger and be like, whoa, this is something interesting. And then, you know, a couple of years down the line, we, trying people out, he, you know, so, uh, but that had to be pretty intimidating to like come into the band, not only as a second singer, but then after we did an album with Patton, who he was, fan of and then you know he's the next one on the mic yeah, yeah that's a lot no of pressure, bro. pressure and and i think that um there's a real respect between them which is cool and um yeah what does mike think of greg i think he thinks greg's great you know yeah well i was actually listening to the new album there is like these patton esque kind of yeah. just that yeah like just like patton's always painted from so so many different yeah. colors in the palette yeah. and that's like what i've always liked about him he has that intensity but you know some heavy bands you feel like you're being punched in the head yeah. like repeatedly for an hour like there's sometimes i feel like that but yeah. but sometimes yeah, but you can very yeah. few uh, i it's mean an art to it, not to be like i'm not not pretentious or it's just my opinion mm -hmm. like there's very few like heavy or guys who are doing like heavy vocals and singing and stuff like that that can do it without seeming cheesy to me like, yeah i mean it's it's a really hard thing to balance well, yeah and you know like totally and there's yeah. a there's a bunch of bands that i i'm like well i don't really like i didn't like new metal and yeah. the metal core that is basically like pop songs where you scream occasionally right. just irritates the right. shit out it's of me very formula it's, like, it's very yeah so I'll go listen to billy ocean right. then i'll go listen to dillinger they don't need yeah. to be together okay <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that's cool yeah no but that's the thing it's very hard to do that well so i think Anyone who does really takes a note from Patton's book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because well, he was the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Who made it interesting and sure. still made it heavy. Yeah. Kind of thing. Sure. Um, so I I explored a thing in interviews which I think is sometimes quite interesting, which is looking at the five songs that people listen to the most on Spotify mm. and maybe sharing a story that people might not know about it. Mm. Um, so Milk Lizard, what's something about the making of that song that maybe people don't know about? Um, you have a thing. Sorry. Yeah, it was a little bug. It's good now. Um, one thing about Milk Lizard. Well, I, I actually remember um, I was in bed and I just started doing it in my head. I was kind of half in a, um, like a dream. And I wrote the whole song in my head, chorus, everything. And I woke up and just ran and recorded it real quick. Fin front to end. You know, obviously just the music, you know what I mean? But like front to end. Went back to bed and then woke <laughs> up. I was like, that's done. Easy. This whole songwriting thing is really easy. That's a good thing. Well, yeah, that yeah. was one that was like one of those things that just like, you know. That's a mad riff to it. Natural, you know. Yeah. Just supernatural. Just yeah. just felt cool. I was like, what did everyone else say I when you brought why. it to you? Um, they didn't really have a choice because I didn't give people a choice. It's like, here's our next song. <laughs> Okay, black oh, bubble gum. Black bubble gum. Um, oh, it, well, it was really fun. When we were in the studio doing black bubble gum, there's this like Tom thing that Gil did. It was like boom, 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 boom. That, during like a pre-chorus, and we were totally going for like a journey thing. We were like, dude, let's do the journey. Like, don't stop. Boom, 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 boom. Like a total journey thing. And we like did that Tom thing in there. And like, we were like, yes, yes. Total journey thing. No one would ever probably think of that, but yeah, I, th I honestly yeah. think that we may have actually just yeah, shared something for them. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> on at least one song, you wanted to be journey. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, maybe all the time. Maybe you've yeah. always been like My first concert was journey. Really? Yeah. Did it have a profound impact on you? It did. It's like a stadium of everyone singing these songs, you know. And, and uh, then you went and made a band where it's really hard to sing all the songs. Although people do sing the songs, do they? Do have you been getting it on the fun early yeah. tour? Yeah. Totally. I mean, the, the F Dillinger fans are f like fanatics, man. It's like, you know, because it, it's not an easy band to listen to. So when you get it, you feel part of something. 
special. Because yeah. it, it's a special person to be able to take the time to absorb this stuff. So um, I think everyone who does really feels a kinship. And well, it's a good human filter. People yeah. who like people who like challenging music are often interesting people yeah. because it's a little, you know, it takes a yeah. it takes a different kind of a mind. Okay, one of us is the killer. One of us is the killer. Okay, well, that was like the last song we wrote for that album titled One of Us is the Killer. And Billy and I just like really jammed that in a room. Like there wasn't really any pre, it wasn't something I brought to the table or something. It was like. Is that unusual, things being born in a jam room? Uh, I think th over the past couple of years, our music is a, is a total combination of stuff that's premeditated and brought to the table and then combined with stuff that me and Billy are just jamming. And then sending it to the next stage and having Liam do his bass and building off of that. But, um, they, yeah, I think since Billy's been in the band, there's been no, um, or at least since Gil's even been in the band, there's been no formula of how to, like, you know, if it's a pan. Just magically, yeah. Sometimes. Just so how did it feel in that room? Uh, well, I remember we wrote that thing, and it was, like, the last song we wrote, and it was, some, like, an afterthought. It's done very quickly, like Milk Lizard, kind of, and... Um, and I, it's the one where when, when I got it back from Greg, I was like, whoa, this song really turned into something amazing. Like, you it's know, bitching. Yeah, like I was able to like really enjoy it as a fan. I had no pre, you know, conceived <laughs> idea of what this thing would be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and so it was a real special moment. That's the ultimate, really. You yeah. get back and you're like, okay, symptom of terminal illness. <sighs> Which one is that again? Yeah, you know, it's a thing, uh, dissociation. Symptom of turning <laughs> Which one is that again? Yeah. I've made a lot of songs. Yeah. yeah. Lots of notes. Yeah. <laughs> Something about that song. It's dark. It's good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice feedback, right? Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's really meaningful. I don't think I have a special story for that one. Okay, that can just not. not, not <laughs> I can't. I'd have to make something else. Um. What was the other one? I showed it to you before. I like this game. Yeah, it's fun though. Think back to well, it's, it's a thing, you yeah. know. What are okay? So someone asked me about you playing something from under the running board tonight. Oh. Yeah. What was it? That was like the first release you did, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, we put out a self-titled release, which was essentially our demos, and then we did a three-song EP called Under the Running Board, and that's really what most people first heard us, you know. What 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 was the experience of making that like, and how did you feel kind of going? Oh, man, well, that was cool because our first uh, self-titled, which I guess, like I said, was basically demos of the guys just were just getting to know each other and figure out, you know, we had played in other bands together and stuff, but figuring out what this thing was going to be. Yep. Um, but it wasn't that original, you know, it was still like we were trying to figure out what w it was that we wanted to do. And then um, I remember I was just so competitive at that time. And I was so over like clicks and the scenes and yeah. the, it was a whole thing. you know, I was yeah. just like, it was so, it was just like. I what year like was this? 1998? 97, yeah. 98, you know, and. Marilyn Manson was a big deal. Yeah, I mean, and, and even in this underground scene, it was supposed to be somewhere that you could go to be accepted from like the jocks and the cheerleaders and like go yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just as bad, you know, yeah, it yeah. was just like, you know, <laughs> if you weren't. Yeah, I feel really, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. really lucky to grow up around jazz and metal nerds. So I had yeah. like two bands. One was right. called Stiphilis, okay. which is the still the best high school metal band name it's ever. Cool, yeah. It's pretty cool. Stiphilis. Anyway, Bad case yeah. of Stiphilis. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and um, so I remember like that, that, that EP, Under the Running Board, those three songs were really just like a big middle finger. Like to me, I remember I was me and our drummer Chris, we just get super worked up. And I'd be like telling him, like, play faster. And he's like, I can. I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> and then we'd be playing. And I'd be like, because I was more the like, punk guy and he was more the technical guy. And he, he kind of made me more technical and I made him more punk. So, like, you know, that's cool. Pushing me to be more technical and be better at guitar. And I'd be pushing him to like play on more cymbals, like hit harder, not play little. S I'm like, get rid of that little splash. We don't need that. What is this? <laughs> little bell? Get. What is that? A bell? Get rid of that, you know? I want all China symbols, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and a so, cowbell. Yeah, so, you know, and I want you to use a cowbell as a as a, as a drumstick. Yeah. You know? But um yeah, I just remember making him do all this crazy blast and fast stuff on a China symbol and him being like, This is not a crash. It's <laughs> not meant for this. It's not built to be did I'm like, I don't care to break it. 
and I, he just gets so pissed and we just started going and that album was just like the product of like that pretty much you yeah. know it's like you're yeah have you spoken to chris lately because i know you guys ended in a yeah. pretty full-on yeah. moment he yeah. i've i've i have seen him and spoke to him throughout the years like a few times but he's the only one who doesn't really he kind of just like disappeared mm. you know and, and um it, you know we think about it because these last shows are coming up and like you know would he come out what do you want but you know i just think he's kind of like in a different place in his life you know he went and joined other bands and i don't even think he plays drums anymore well it's such a shame because he was such such a talent you know it's yeah how do you feel about like what happened there was that the biggest most dramatic departure and ending or? yeah it was tough i mean um we were we were creatively you know we were really important to each other but honestly we were just were different people really different yeah. people so i think um you know his ethic his work ethic to play drums was like nobody else you know it was insane yeah. all he wanted to do is sit in his basement and practice and i was the guy who's like i don't there's no point if you're not out there you know, and I was the you guy. You got nothing to bring back, yeah. I was the guy who was like getting a job at an office so I could use the coffee machine to make flyers and like, you know, dude, I feel you. Going <laughs> to shit, like wanting to go to shows, like basement shows and stuff, and go in the city and see crazy shit. And um, I was just like the hustler, you know. I was like into the the whole thing, not yeah. just playing. We know? all came from the like New York, New Jersey, DC area where there's a lot going on and a lot of bands and the Chrome Mags and and the bad brains, living in, in, in the suburbs and right outside of the city and having all this crazy stuff going on all the time and like being able to sneak into the city and see all this crazy, dangerous, like unpredictable subculture and music was extremely, uh, had a huge effect on me. And um, like I said, you know, the metal world was what it was, but it was the hardcore and punk world that really shaped the attitude of like just the, art, the work ethic and you know the attitude of like you should be here to play and to, to to kick ass and to like you know have a cathartic outlet for you know for all your emotions i like wanted to go out there and then bring it back into the the practice space but like you know and um i think that we didn't get each other sometimes that like he didn't understand why all we didn't do is play all the time in some basement like every thing was like what good are we if we're just in a basement you know, you so, have, yeah, being a creative, yeah, but I think that kind of dynamic has helped w grow what Dillinger was. But um, I think it ultimately kind of clashed, and mm. and he ended up going off and quitting and joining that Coheed band for whatever reasons. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and yeah, it was it it was it was there was it was hurtful, you know. Yeah. But uh, ultimately, I I what I learned from that was really valuable. Was that nobody is everybody's replaceable <laughs> if their heart's not in it yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone's replaceable yeah and they can bring a whole new thing to it yeah well and it's interesting because i remember and, and yeah. this band is more than just one person or two yeah. people this band is is an entity in itself well it's cool to kind of see you guys develop as well and like you know like talking to you and greg like five years ago and ten years ago it's like five years ago i feel like greg was on this whole like existential journey mm -hmm. getting crazy and getting into mushrooms i get a lot out of out of just life experience in general i'm a very sensory person you know yeah. so whether it's like listening I to music can. or working out or being really physical on stage or fucking you know drugs or sex or whatever it is mm -hmm. like i feel like there's a, i'm very sensory oriented i get a lot out of extremes i don't get any a lot of out of moderation and and i feel like i need to go really off somewhere whether yeah. in any direction whether it's being really controlled and working out all the time or whether it's you know like having a crazy fucking night or whether you know anything whatever and i feel like i get a lot out of that and i bring that back and mm. then i have more to write or, or more to draw from and things like that hunter s thompson style yeah you know it really is that way gonzo journalism in life. Yeah, yeah you know you just kind of got to wing it and know that you're gonna land on your feet then you yeah. were in this other place and then it's like you guys have grown up together i mean yeah. i haven't seen greg right now but I, musically totally. it feels like you guys have like grown together into a sure. closer place like oh, yeah yeah like, yeah man like um he he's like uh, we both know that no matter what we do after this it will never be as important as what we do together like we right. both we both know that you know yeah. um what is, what is, so what are you going to do like what are you going to do next have you spoke spoke to like atticus and trent Reznor about doing fa film soundtracks are you <laughs> gonna you gotta go and find a david fincher and yeah, find your dude yeah. and yeah, I'd yeah, certainly yeah. love to do that stuff, but um, I think, you know, I'm not about to go move out to Hollywood and, you know, whatever you got to do, like, 
yeah. to do that. I mean, he was just lucky Fincher just called him. <laughs> obviously, I mean, no, I mean, obviously, you know, they're they're uh, they they work well together, and um, mm. you know, I, I think you know, Nine Inch Nails in particular has always been a, a, a band that's lent itself to movies, t- t- you know, and like trance music has always been so cinematic and so. It, like that stuff can make them like like I've seen Nine Inch Nails songs make a scene, you know what I mean? Like make a movie, like make a scene, like holy, you know? Oh, like um, um, Natural Born Killers. And totally. Yeah. You know? And what's um, your favorite movie? Let's just go there. Why not? I mean, that's hard. I, um, I've had different favorite movies or the yeah. whatever, you know? Like I like. Uh, I remember when this is a we- really weird movie. People either hate this or love this, but when that. Lars von Trier movie Antichrist came out. Yeah, I like. Th- I really love that movie. I love Lars von Trier. I love the whole dogma yeah. movement, which is like it's it's a lot like you know how much about dogma movement. It's like much, it's basically the yeah. antithesis of reality TV. Right. You've got to shoot it. Everything that happens there yes. has to be real sound. It's got to be real yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. No fucking fake music. No bullshit. Mm-hmm. No emotional manipulation. Yeah. Like the dogma movement. I'm really into yeah, it as no, a thing. It's. I, I'm really. I really like. Uh, I was feeling that and. Um, but yeah, a lot of movies. A, I thought that movie, f- the, I think it was an Australian-based movie, Lion, that came out last year. I thought that was a brilliant <laughs> movie. You know, I was watching it on a plane, and the end scene was coming up, and the guy next to me just goes, "Don't worry, you can cry." <laughs> I was like, I was like, what? He's like, it's cool, man. It's cool. I was like, what are you talking about? And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm fine. I just got something right. Being an angry punk rock person, yeah. have you felt angry the whole time? Do you feel like you need to get angry or do you like get into it? Like, cause you've got a pretty violent stage presence, but you seem like a pretty chill dude. How does this all balance itself? There's a lot of holes in my wall at home. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like. But how, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. aggressive music and, but I guess I will, no I've, one's I've, one I've dimensional. Been, you know, I'm a, yeah. I think any artist that's like, you know, <sighs> Most artists are are pretty obsessive compulsive, you know, and and um, so that's that's like that's very um, it's like tormenting, you know, <laughs> like it's not a happy existence to feel that anxiety around things like so much, but it also creates often like amazing music or very detailed music or very thought out or very you know inspired stuff. So um, and uh, so so yeah so this music has been a way for me to deal with that, you know? Um, yeah. Are you nervous about like not having that as an outlet? Like it must be weird to have something so yeah. internal, like so tr- hugely consume you for 20, you know, half your life. Yeah. Well, no, I think yeah. that it's been, it, it's, it, it's also not healthy, you know, cause like, it has you know, been a huge part of your life. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been obsessed with just, you know, this band for 20 years. So it's not really healthy to um, ignore the other parts of your life, too, and not work on yourself. So I think that's a big thing that Greg and I talk about, too, with this album, is we've finally, I think, gotten to the point where we don't need to do this to figure ourselves out anymore. That's really interesting. And this, So this album is really like the climax. It's the last board of the game, you know? Like, we've used yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this band and every album and all these tours to just go through all these stages in our lives and figure ourselves out, and um, everything was often external that we were talking about and this ass album was very internal oh, you that's know really interesting well, when you start to realize that the thing you have to yeah. master more than anything else is your internal world over your right. external world because right. you can't fuck with that of like yeah, yeah. like there's nothing you can do and no. you kind of realize that all happiness and all emotion all everything comes from within right. anyway right. and it's got nothing to do with anyone else yeah, but it must that's, be that's nice really as well to be about. around for your kid as well like yeah, I imagine that yeah. plays a role. Like yeah, I mean I'm yeah. I'm really busy and I've got a crazy schedule coming up and I'm gonna be touring like with another band. Good so great draft tongue orchestra. No, 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 I I don't I'm not gonna talk. You're not about gonna tell it, me. But <laughs> um but yeah no I'm just well, gonna be playing with another band. That's like a big deal then. It is, yeah. but it's like it's it's it's. When are you gonna tell about it? I can just release this when that happens. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> eh, people we will just see. It. But you know. I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to give you the biggest thing that's yeah, happening. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. No, no. I mean, look, it's yeah. it's something that's... Um, that's interesting, though. But I do, yeah, I do try. I plan on trying to be, you know, around for my, my kids a little more and, well, no. Yeah. And, and work on other things as well. I also manage... Uh, Kimbra? Kimbra, who is well-known here. I love that you 
you guys like she used to play in like a Dillinger band. Well, yeah, like her band. Well, her band guys played in like a Dillinger band, yeah. and she was a fan. So, um, yeah. That's that's really cool. I feel like you're in a really good place because you've always made such thoughtful choices. It's cool that you're guiding her career because she's well, a really she, interesting artist. She is. She's a real interesting artist. I get her because we're very, our brains are very similar. And uh, I've been lucky enough to make it this far through the careers that I've had and, and deal with all that stuff that it's um, it's great to, to work with someone like that. Yeah. If you were if you um, were to put like Dillinger Records in like a space mm -hmm like a spaceship in a time capsule, who would you like to share the capsule with? And not necessarily bands that are similar, yeah. but bands you think are their, have their own world. Oh, who would, this, who would yeah, who would be in the capsule? Like obviously yeah. your dead bodies don't have to be in there. That's weird. Um, but like if you were gonna put it and like put it into space yeah. and say that these three flavors are flavors that matter to me. And I think yeah. these people did really triumphant, interesting things. Well, yeah, I think certainly, like you said, not necessarily bands within the same genre, but uh, hopefully bands that have the spirit of yeah. like, yeah. Um, it's a random question. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's so s subjective or. Yeah, but it's your, yeah. yeah, it's your opinion. I mean, I will say this a lot of, you know, the OK Computer came out around the time that we were writing Calculating Infinity, and that was a huge inspiration. Like, wow. you know, that was a huge, huge inspiration. Because um, it was just so much, it was so brave, that album, for them. And yeah, it changed totally. pop music, it changed music, you know. You wouldn't have, like, strings and instrumentation in, like, a Coldplay song if it wasn't for that album. You wouldn't have, you know. Um, well, that's really interesting. You yeah. wouldn't, you know, the recording approaches, like, the influences, stuff like that. Like, How did you work out on calculating infinity about yourself? Because you were saying that you use albums um, to work things out. Yeah, well, at the time, I um, I didn't have any confidence in myself. I, it was tough because we put out this EP under the running board. It was really critically acclaimed. We had signed to like a label that I was Relapse? a fan of. Relapse? Yeah, I was a big Relapse fan. And we were starting to get to be this band that people were expecting things from. And then, um, you know, our bass player got paralyzed and wasn't it unable to play bass you know yeah and our guitar player from that time quit and went off he's like I'm gonna go do computer science and I, this is getting too serious for me kind of like I didn't expect this to work <laughs> so this like, now you tell me bad. like now you tell me he's like I just thought like we played three shows and no one would care and then I get to go back and be in my computer science I was like oh sorry buddy <laughs> success How yeah and so um, basically I was alone you know to make that album it was me and our drum and a drummer so I had to like play, learn all the guitar, learn all the bass, play all the bass, play all the guitar, play all the, and I, I was really like, you know, there were moments when I was like, how, how, I don't think I can do this, you know, I don't think, you know, um, like I said, those guys were more technical, and I was more like just punk rock motherfucker. Punk. Yeah, I was like blues and stuff. I didn't play shredding guitar. I wasn't like that guy, and I knew that some of that was a big important element of what we were building. So I really had to like step up and like. Uh, in all places, so I mean, it was certainly a confidence boost to be able to make an album that I felt. Um, That's huge, dude. People felt was like really, you know. Yeah. You actually yeah. Trent Reznor that shit. <laughs> I don't know about that, but. Um, but it's, it's well, but, you know, yeah. I feel like we we and and we wrote we made that album in two weeks to tape. There was no computers, there was no Pro Tools, there was no cut and pasting. You it's know, a real every shit. Every guitar, every bass line, everything. You couldn't move vocals. You couldn't, you know, we just fucking nailed it out, man. And it, it so stands that. up. It yeah, stands so up like a real thing. It was it really, really, uh, yeah. it, it really was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, I know this is sort of different, but it's, um, we were taught, the last time we were talking about it, 18 months ago, we were talking, um, it was around the time David Bowie died, and I was looking at the way he, engineered his exit was so fucking oh, profound and artistic and you're just like dude he didn't tell anyone anything he told the whole fucking yeah. story through art and it was just like holy fucking shit and you kind of go no one has left the planet with more grace and it's exactly. like and i don't know do you see like engineering your exit i mean obviously you mm -hmm. don't have a choice in yeah. that in that instance and right. like you know the world will be less yeah, forever it was, a, it, was a, it was beautiful yeah. and it was like it was one of those things where you're simultaneously upset and inspired you know yeah. you're like it's really emotional. i'm really yeah. sad but i'm also so inspired 
like well, it's just, yeah you made such incredible music right up yeah. to the end yeah. you're gonna be making yeah. music forever you are yeah. like let's be real it's not like you're gonna start fucking knitting <laughs> are you you know maybe you, you maybe you'll be a really good knitter a knitter maybe i don't know man maybe i'll knit i don't know i would like to uh maybe i don't know i'm gonna have a farm you're gonna have a farm yeah. you're still vegan no i was never vegan. you unvegan I've never been vegan. You've never been Liam vegan. Was vegan. Liam was vegan, but uh, no judgment. I don't eat meat. I don't eat meat, yeah. um, and I rarely have any kind of dairy. But um, yeah, I might be milking little goat teats. Yeah, that's a very different life. What will you miss the most about Dillinger? I think just like being in all these different places all around the world so often, and uh, take you know I, I think we took that for granted that we're just going to be back. We can just, you know, forever, yeah. forever, you know, what have been the yeah. met so many people like you and all this stuff that I'm like, I'll see them again. I'll see them again. And now it's like, maybe I won't, you know, yeah. it's well, crazy. Well, well, I'd like to go and move to your city. So hopefully, yeah, right. your city's a bit more cool. What, New York's got a bit more to New York's got a bit more to it. Sydney's been great, but I think the swelling's gone down. Well, too, you got like you guys got deer that stand up yeah. and have vouchers. Any any final words? <laughs> You're not dying, but yeah. uh, no. No, no he's words. got no final words. Leave it, leave it with the music. Well, this is I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll cut some footage from the show tonight. Yes. Uh, Dillinger.